it was a freshman um, orientation at a university. And the uh, <laughs> dean of students was meeting with all the freshmen. And they had all the girls on one side and all the boys on the other side. And they did that intentionally because they wanted to make the point that the boys stayed in the boys' dorms and the girls stayed in the girls' dorms and never should they cross paths. And it was a deal that if the first time a boy was caught in the girls' dorm, because they assumed the boys would be the ones who were doing it, it was a $100 fine. The second time they caught a boy in the girls' dorm, it was a $250 fine. And the third time, it was a $500 fine and expulsion. And there was a student kind of in the back corner, I'm not making any suggestions or anything, but there was a, a gentleman in the back corner who raised his hand and the dean said, can I help you? And he said, yes, sir. I'd like to know how much it would cost you just to get a season pass. <laughs> so, um, I'm feeling like I need to talk to Dr. Bullard about a season pass for Pfeiffer because I'm spending a good bit of time up here. Um, but uh, it has been a good experience to come and go and be back and forth and, and all of the things. Um, I was talking to some of your classmates who arrived early and we were talking about whether or not it's been a good thing or not. And Dr. Gross wasn't in here yet, so they were very honest. And um, But uh, hopefully it's been a good experience for you guys to have us going back and forth. Um, today is National Dandelion Day, if that makes any difference to you. Um, and then it's also National Flash Drive Day. And I don't know if you remember the first time you ever saw Flash Drive, but I was working with the IT guy at church, and he said he had brought he brought what he needed to, he would just put it on my computer. He had that little flash drive. And I didn't know what it was, and I had no clue that all the information he needed to share with me was gonna be on that little stick that he was gonna stick into my computer. But of course he was right, and uh, so it's that day. Um, 19, I'm sorry, 16, 14, Pocahontas got married. Who did she marry? Thomas all right, and then um, in uh, 1792, George Washington did something for the first time. He issued a um, uh, veto for the first time, 1792 on today. And then in 1955, Winston Churchill had enough, and he resigned from being prime minister in England. So a few things from the day. Um, you will not have to listen to me today, other than th this brief introduction. Um, I've brought another friend, just to prove to you I have more than two or three. Um, <laughs> I think you were a little worried about whether or not I just had those couple of friends. Uh, but uh, Mr. Watson, Ralph Watson, comes to us by way of, of the world, essentially. And we met um, a couple of weeks, ago, a month or six weeks ago or so for the first time. And then again, a couple of weeks ago to just talk about business stuff. Um, he is a graduate of the University of Georgia. Okay, no comments about that. Um, I assume, having met him and all the things that we talked about, there would be some business degree some um, management, some leadership, something or another, but he actually has a degree in agriculture. Um, and um, so I asked how in the world do you get from agriculture to where you are, which is exactly what we talked about the last time I was here, when that panel of people talked about what their degree was in and how in the world they got into their current job. And it's, a, it's a long roundabout way from dairy leadership and management to a senior executive analyst with an international corporation, um, having analyzed businesses around the world and taught and experienced in all sorts of things. Um, moving to the Stanley County area because he finally found the closest place you can get to heaven is here. So he finally arrived and showed up. Um, so he's been looking for ways to serve in the community and ways to provide some leadership. And this seemed like a really good opportunity to share some information and give you guys a different experience and a different voice to listen to. Um, let's do this one more time just so he knows who he's talking to. Um, how many of you are from Stanley County? None of you. I remember that. Um, how many of you are from North Carolina? So most North Carolina, and then outside of North Carolina, where? Georgia. Georgia? Florida. Anybody else? Okay. And then how many business majors? All right. That's most. And then non-business majors, remind us of who you are, what you're studying. Engineering. Engineering. Computer information. Computer information systems. Visual communications. Visual communications. English. English. I knew there was an English major in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Biology. In biology. So. That covers, and then how many freshmen? Sophomores, a couple of sophomores, juniors, and then seniors. Okay, all right, so that gives you an idea of, of the, the crowd that we're dealing with. Um, so far, uh, Dr. Gross says they're the smartest group on campus, just in general, compared to the other classes. And we're not sure how that's gonna play out at finals time, but um, thank you, Dr. Gross, and uh, Ralph, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, one quick comment, I uh, wasn't expecting all of that uh, introduction, but with regard to uh, agricultural degree, I've got another seminar called The Laws of Growth. You know, everybody wants to talk about growing, and this is not, this is land yeah, as they say in Louisiana, this is something that just ought to go. <clears throat> but uh, 
the truth of the matter is growth is the natural result of a healthy organism. When, when you were a baby, your parents didn't have to come in there and go, okay, get up. You stretch, time to grow. You know, they just fed you, changed your diaper, made sure you're well, and hello, you grew. And that's true of crops. I think it's true of business. You know, you got to break up the pile of ground. You got to do your planting correctly. You got to plant healthy seeds. And what you sow, you're going to reap, right? You got to keep the weeds out because you got competition in the business arena. I'm not going to go through all that. Maybe I'll get another invite since I'm planting a seed here for a, for a future uh, future request. I understand somebody who in the room has a has launched a business or is uh, involved with a, a an ongoing business. Okay. Would you mind coming up here and helping me with this? Uh oh. Sorry. <laughs> right, tell me your name, sir. Lane. Lane. Ralph Watson. Good to meet you, sir. Oh, are you? You don't mind looking at it. That's good. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, tell me a little bit about the business. Um, so, it's a family oriented business. Okay. It's out of Charlotte. Uh, we build and manufacture custom truck bodies for big uh, companies like Auto Crane. Okay. Caterpillar. Okay, good. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is. is uh, this presentation is called the bridge to there. And generally, I do it for business owners in their in their office or warehouse. I've done it on. <clears throat> and I, I'm kind of old school. Uh, normally, I use a 15 foot roll of white freezer paper because it's got plastic back in. And I put this on the you know back in the back of the warehouse on the side of the delivery truck. You know, I've done it everywhere, um, but it, it, it's helpful to have a little bit of banter. You don't, have, you don't have to use actual numbers for your company, okay. but just make up stuff. Okay, okay. we, we can roll like that. All right. As a senior executive analyst, I'd like to share with you. Well, first of all, what consulting <coughs> is is putting franchise systems in independent businesses. If you bought a franchise, you would get a marketing program. You get financial program, you get employee program, you get all this stuff, and you pay a big price for it. You know, I don't know what a McDonald's franchise goes anymore. Quarter million dollars, half million dollars, some of these places is it, not unheard of. So entrepreneurs are launching on their own, and unfortunately, too many times they they don't have all these systems in place, right? And so they're making it up as they go. And, so my hat's off to you, number one, for being bold enough to even consider going into business for yourself, where there is no safety net. <laughs> You're it. Um, and, and for coming to a, to a university setting to learn about business. Uh, and the way the consulting worked was um, the, the consulting companies would have uh, a boiler room where people would be on the phone calling businesses going, hey, you know, I think they could get to the owners. How's business? Great. Could it be better? Well, maybe, you know, and we'll keep mind if we send somebody out. And so they, uh, somebody would go out and try to talk to him about the business and how to improve it. And uh, if they decided they want, wanted to engage uh, for, for a nominal fee, business wise, it's nominal, maybe $600, maybe $2,000, depending on the size of the business, an analyst would go in. And it was sort of like a, in the medical profession, a diagnostician. They're in there to diagnose what's going on. I'm trying, I just want to give you a little background before we get up here on the board. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so that was my role. I'd show up, sight unseen, interview the owner for a couple of hours, go through their financials. So by the time I got to this, I've already seen everything. Um, don't know what their plans are, but that's okay. Uh, another thing I wanted to share with you is uh, because we're going to hit on this a couple of times just because you can't help if you're really looking at it. There's two, two major components in the, in the business. One is organizational. And one is operational.
organization has to do with the board of directors, the long view, the strategic plan. Uh, <clears throat> it's about succession, you know, how we gonna hand this off to the next generation. Operational is uh, the management. This is about leadership. This is about management. And, and just because a lot of people uh, question sometimes what's the difference between leadership and management, the word manage, the root word is, is the word for hands, manual labor. So it's things that you have your hands on, and it's about keeping all rules. And there are a lot of rules to keep in business. There are safety rules, there are budget rules, there's employee handbook rules, there's just all kinds of rules. So management's about keeping the rules and making incremental change. So we're going to grow by 10% this year. We're going to manage everything. Leadership, on the other hand, <laughs> I'm not sure I should say this in front of a dean, is about breaking all the rules and making a quantum leap. It's about going in there doing things we've never done before in a new direction, tackling a new market. So as we uh, as we progress through this, I, I'm going to encourage you to uh, ask questions, hold questions to end, whatever you want to do, game on. <clears throat> so see how quick I can lose something. Lane? Yes, Lane. Uh, you know, you and I talked a lot about your business this morning, your financials. I kind of know where you are. Um, but since I haven't done that, why don't you just kind of give me, what, what's your, and again, use bogus numbers if you wish, what's your uh, annual revenue? Uh, we'll say quarter million. 250,000, okay. <laughs> and net profit? Okay. How many points you got? Uh, 84. 84. Um, when was the last time you took a vacation? Uh, probably a year ago. Okay, that's not bad. Um, the, um, right, we're going to drag this out. How many hours a week are you working? 45. 45. All right. Having fun? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Tell me something. Where do you want to be? Say five years. Five years. Uh, probably um, at least a million. Okay. What do you think your bottom line ought to be? Yeah, you you profit loss. I'm assuming you don't want a loss, but I don't, I don't want a loss. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. How many employees do you think it's going to take to get, get you there? What? One twenty. One twenty. Okay. And. Uh, how many hours a week you want to be working five years? Forty. Forty, okay. And I'm, since you're already having fun, I guess you'd like to have more fun, right? Okay, good. Tell me, Lane, how are you going to get there? That's what you got to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> See, now, now, this is exactly what a business owner would say to me, okay? And I would say to him, no, you're not. It's not my job to tell you that. My job was to come in and find out what's wrong with you, if anything, what's costing you on an annual basis, and what it takes to fix it chose to. You're going to be in just as big a mess when I leave as when I got here. So tell me, how are you, how are you going to get there? I guess you keep working on it. Okay. Get the name off of it. All right. Can I suggest it takes a bridge? Okay. It takes a bridge to get from where you are to where you want to be. <clears throat> and I'm going to suggest that the first section of that bridge is called strategic Plan. 
This is the what? <coughs> what? Where's that English major? You know the seven serving men, who, what, when, where, why, how much? How and how much? Here we go. Um, this is about purpose. Vision. Mission. Core values. I know this is all it may sound rhetorical or things you've heard before. But what business are you in and why are you in it? I went to a business uh, owner in Alabama who was he said thought he was in the construction business. He put roofs, doors, windows, porches, those sorts of things on houses. As I talked to him, it turned out that all of his employees were not employees at all. They were contractors. So I said, I had the second day and he was already gun shot me being there. I said, so tell me, what business are you in, actually? He said, well, I thought I was in a construction business before you showed up. He said, now I'm not quite sure. I said, well, if you're, if you're subbing out all the work, are you not really in the marketing business? See, his job was to go out and find people who needed a roof, who needed a, wanted a porch, who wanted to change out their doors and windows. It was marketing, and then he's going to hand it off, right? So do you think those two mindsets would cause you to think differently? Absolutely. <clears throat> now, we're going to camp out on this for just a minute. Actually, it's going to be more than a minute. If you were to... I have seen so many. These labels put on so many different things. It, as a professional consultant, it, it got me bothered to the point where I decided I was going to wrestle it down for me. This is me. You can take it or leave it. Don't matter. I'm here to. I'm here to pour out what little I know. <clears throat> Hopefully, you can absorb the, the smidgen of it. If you were to go to Barnes & Noble and buy 10 books on strategic planning, you're going to come up with about 12 different definitions of these words. So this is, this is Ralph trying to cut through the clutter for you. A purpose has two distinctions, more than anything, more than any of the rest of them. Number one, it never changes. Number two, it's never completely realize. It's never completely fulfilled. Now, God gave me an interesting um, gift. I seem to have an ability to take complex issues and sort of make them kitchen table simple. So Lane, you got a hammer here, buddy. What's the purpose of a hammer? Drive nails. To drive nails. Excellent. Will that purpose ever change? Most likely. Will this one hammer drive every nail that's ever been created? Probably not. Okay. So it meets the definition of a purpose, right? To drive nails. It's, it's never going to change. It's never going to drive every nail that's ever been created. <coughs> but Lane, I got this little finishing nail here, dude. I could use this hammer to put up your wife's expensive crown molding. I'm just assuming you're not married, but just play along with this. I'm playing, right? Okay, ladies, at ease. Yeah, we'd both be in trouble, right? Because this is a 22 ounce framing claw hammer. Right here. I got this little bad boy, you know? Its purpose is to put up just such intricate wood uh, millwork, right? What else I got? Hmm? Now you probably get to do this because you're a lot stronger than I am. You know, I could pound on this nail out in the backyard for half a day and get it through that landscape timber. However, I got this bad boy. <laughs> It'll make quick work of it, right? Okay. So the question class is uh, Lane's being a good sport. <coughs> You're all in this class. 
The question is, what's the purpose of this hammer? It's a 22 ounce framing claw hammer. So we don't have any people bending in frame instruction. Instruction. Well, kind of cut to the chase. I know I got a little more time this morning than normal. And by the way, if the business owner's giving me a lot of hoo-hoo, I'll, <laughs> I'll drag him out on this one. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, the purpose of this hammer is to drive 16 penny nails into two inch number two pine. That's what framing is. Two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, 16 penny nails. May I suggest, sir, when you've got your purpose that clearly defined, you're on to something. You see, the purpose of Disney, and there's a formula. There's a formula for a purpose statement. You start with the word to, I guess that's a preposition, something like that. I'm going to show my to action. Target, market, um, call it a So, the purpose of Disney to make people happy. Will that ever change? Will Disney ever make everybody on the planet happy? purpose for the nation of Israel to provide a safe place on earth for the Jewish people. So that's the that's the broad formula. No. And if you if you get this right, you're ready to start. Yet who said this? If you don't know what your purpose is, your purpose is to figure out what your purpose is. That's just how preeminent this is. And it's hard talking to business owners about this because it seems so academic, so esoteric. Uh, <clears throat> but how many of you ever played with a gyroscope? It was a little psh, sits there and kind of walls around like this. It doesn't fall down. We will wobble, but they don't fall down. Uh, in early ocean going ships, they would put a gyroscope in the middle of the ship. This is a, a heavy wheel that spins. So when it got into a storm and, and, the, and the ship wanted to lean to the left, that, that gyroscope pulled tight to keep them vertical. That's the purpose of the purpose. Now, a vision is a future reality written in the present tense, as if it had already happened. So Lane's vision, and it has to be full of a lot of color and texture and grandeur. It's like trying to explain to somebody, we're going on vacation. Aren't you excited? We're going to the ocean. And you can feel the, I can't wait to get my feet from my toes in the sand. Oh, the trade winds blowing against me. And I the smell of the salt air and the sunshine. Woo, I'm ready to go, y'all. <laughs> Let's load up the bus and go. Got to take her in the back. <clears throat> but it's the idea is, and this goes back to leadership. You're wanting to cast a vision for your employees that make them want to go where you're going. And the purpose of your business cannot be to make money. Nobody wants to jump out of bed in the morning and go, woo! Can't wait to go in there and make old Lane some more money. See, it's got to have a higher purpose. And the people at Disney, oh yeah, oh yeah, they jump out of bed in the morning and go, won't even make people happy. Because it gives significance to their lives. <clears throat> so, you know, a vision statement, and, and I encourage you to write like a page or two, just as much as you can. <clears throat> You can always boil it down later to a vision statement. But you know, truck body company, Acme Truck Body Company is a $1 million uh, company uh, producing truck bodies, uh, shipping them internationally. Uh, you know, you just you, you give that 
that vision. And then you have to validate your vision. I mean, it's one thing to go out there and go, oh, I got this great idea. You know? And you think your baby's pretty because it's your baby. But sometimes there are ugly babies. <laughs> <laughs> Not, nobody in this room, I'm saying, you know, but you got to validate that your vision is something other people want. And then a mission is, is what uh, Jim uh, would call the big, hairy, audacious goal. If you read good to great, you, you get the concept. Missions are designed to be accomplished. They're the big chunks that, that are going to move you from here to there. So the, uh, the best example I can give of this happened before any of you were born, uh, but I was young enough to remember when Russia put Sputnik up. That was the first satellite that went up in space, and nobody knew what that thing was or would do or the impact it would have on, on, on America. But all they knew is Sputnik's up there doing this, and Khrushchev is banging his shoe on the desk at the United Nations said, we're going to bury America. My poor God, the mother in South Georgia went nuts. All she could see was her two boys growing up in a communist America speaking Russian. And President Kennedy stepped up to the microphone that day. And he said, in the next decade, we're going to put a man on the moon and bring him back alive. Vision call. I mean, everybody, everybody was pulling together. There was no division. There was no politics. There was no, it was about getting the job done. And there were many missions. There was the Freedom Mission, the Apollo Mission. You know, uh, you had to get the rocket to go up and come down, and you had to get the monkey to go up, and go around, and you know. So there was all these different missions. <coughs> Mercury mission. But eventually it happened. See, but Kennedy never stated publicly the purpose of the space program. But the purpose of the space program was to make the United States of America a military superpower. Now, should that ever change? Are we ever going to get to a point where we Everybody in the world loves us so much we don't need a military. I don't want, we're not going to wax political here. <clears throat> but that's the, that's the power of purpose. Knowing what you're going, the power of vision and having the missions in place to get you where you want to go. The core values are the non negotiables. Listen to me, young people the non-negotiables in your life. you got a great mentor here, Dr. Lamel. It matters, right now, it matters in your life what you're willing to put up with. If you're willing to cut corners, it's going to be a bad day. See, if you, want your, if you want your employees one day to be honest and have integrity, you need to be honest right now. You need to have integrity right now. And when I talk to business owners, I promise to you, <laughs> just to get their attention sometimes, I'll talk about it, it's the non-negotiables in your life. It's the hills upon which you are willing to die. It's the reason you would shut your business down and walk away from it before you let your employees drag your name in the dirt. See, I woke up another one there. Nice <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you, you know, it's like, well, honesty and integrity, you know, they're always like on the top, top three. But what is what is what does honesty mean to you? What does integrity mean to you? You've got to define it in your life. And if you say, you know, and how's that going to factor into, into our business and into our ethics? So, 
and this is as best I can define this for you. This is your company's DNA. This is this is the essence of who you are. Um, I've got a. I've seen a lot of job descriptions in my day, but I never saw one for a small business owner. So I wrote one, <laughs> and I got one up here. I think for twenty people. <laughs> I hope we got less than that right now. So you're you're welcome to take that with you. But uh, it, it's time to move on to the next to the next to the next place. Well, I lost, my, I lost my black one. Here it is. The next section is what we want to speed is a tactical plan. All right. This is going to be the how, how we're going to get there, and when. about a one, three, five year business plan. Flexible. <clears throat> it's about a balanced scorecard. It's about goals. Now, you've probably seen this report, S M. A R T smart goals, not timelines. Yes, schedules. There, there are many different reasons to write a business plan. One's probably get a good grade in this class from this is prestigious university. Some it reasons you write a business plan is, is to give, to flesh out the bones of your company. Some business plans you write to get funded. We want people to invest in your company. But a sh short term, mid term, long term business plan. And this is not something you write and stick on the shelf. You use it. And at the end of one year, your two rolls over, your four rolls over, you add another, another year five. Uh, and, and a balanced scorecard is, is a way to keep track of what's going on in your business as you're moving as you're moving forward. Uh, so, and, and this is the tactical plan describes how we're going to do the strategic plan. And so this this is part of the board of directors, and you're sitting like, you're sitting there going like, you know, you get board of directors, all we got. And employees. Well, the, uh, the job description is going to help clarify that for you because too many times it's easy. Listen to me. It's easy to get in a business. You just go online, the Secretary of State, and get you a name for your business. Go to the IRS.gov and get yourself a federal employee ID number, and you know, you're in business. It's really tricky to get out of one. It's really tricky. When you get to an exit strategy succession plan, how do we hand this off? And, you know, I'll just speak to that real quickly. Um, I'm thinking of a of an electrical contractor. I can't even remember what this company was, but uh, <clears throat> two brothers decided to go into the electrical business. 50-50, bad plan. Bad plan. 50-50, it takes. It, it only takes one to say no, but it takes two to say yes. So, but one of them had two sons in the business. The other one had a daughter who wasn't in the business. I sat down with them one day and I said, so, you know, she's gonna get half the profit. No, no. Like, well, did you say your uncle owned half the business? Yeah, and your dad owns half the profit. So you're going to get 25%, you're going to get 
she's going to be 50%. Man, I ain't fair. I ain't fair. What are you talking about? I ain't fair. And this goes back to the organizational versus operational. I told you we're going to keep coming back to that. I said, look, you guys are getting your tricked out truck, you know, you're getting your insurance, you get paid vacations, you get none of that. So, y'all are being paid competitive wages when it comes time to split up profit 25, 25, 50. Done. See, that's the kind of stuff you don't plan for it in the, in the, in the boardroom or organizationally can rent, can tear families apart. You know, you, you've heard of the saying, blood sicker than water. I have lived long enough, as these other two gentlemen have, to know, unfortunately, money can be thicker than blood. And for whatever reason you go into business, you're not going into it to tear your family apart. But it can happen. So, you get the tactical plan, you gotta have some people to help you, right? And this is where I, I, I wanna be a little careful. Because I've talked about organizational level and operational level, I'm speaking of this in, in the context of operations. So you need, and this is the word, this is the who. Who's going to do it? The organizational plan, you must have an org chart. I cannot begin to tell you. And, and when we do these, when I do these surveys, we would have, we get the employees together in a room like this. We give everybody two, 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 th two pages. Uh, one was a uh, management assessment. The other was just sort of a question answer thing. It's like, you don't have to put your name on it unless you want to talk to me when it's over with. If you say you want to talk to me and I don't, your name ain't like, but it's all confidential anyway. And so they would, uh, some of the questions were, Who's your direct supervisor? Well, Lance. Who else tells you what to do? Well, Reese, Mary Jane, and Jim Bob Billy Jack. You know. And so when you get when you get to the get all those pages up and you get to the hotel room that night and you go, okay, we got number one. He reports to number two, you know, here, here, here. Or, or maybe I should do this the other way. Got these are many people telling number one what to do. Here's number two. He's got he's got this one and this one and that one to do. Here's number three. He's got this one and this one and that one and this one to tell him what to do. You know, no wonder it's lack of communication. And it's hard for business owners if they're walking through the shop, seeing something going wrong, not to jump in there and say, "Who told you to do that that way?" Lane did. Well, I ain't way to do it. Do it this way. That's the way we've always done it. See? But there has to be a certain, there's got to, that integrity, you've got to hold back. As a business owner, you've got to hold back and go through you, the chain of command, hello, that you created. And there's, there's a saying that you hire your problems. There's a saying. So you've got to have a, an organizational chart. You've got to have performance. based job descriptions. This is this is huge. Most job descriptions read something like this. Do this, do that, do something else. Well, okay. But at what level? Performance based job descriptions say do this at this level, do this at this level, do this at this level. I'm going to role play this a little bit. Tell me your name, sir. Dante. Dante? Yes, sir. Okay. Dante. Thank you. <clears throat> oh. 
I'm going. I won't pretend you y'all are working for her. Right? Uh, let, me pick, let me pick on somebody. Else. What's your name? I'm Ben. Ben? Yeah. Okay, Ben. I'm Dante. <clears throat> I own the company. I've hired y'all. You're out there doing a good job. And, uh, you know, me and Dante, we die. I mean, I, I, he comes over to my house for dinner. We take vacations together. You know, but his work's not quite where it needs to be. And Ben, dude, when you say good morning to me, it just kind of ticks me off. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah, sometimes down. chemistry don't work that way, right? Yep. So, but you're, you're getting it. You're making your numbers, you see. And so when it comes time for performance review, if we didn't have the, the, the performance standards, Dante, dude, I like you. I'm going to give you 10%. I'm like him. I'm like him. Two, two percent for him. See, Ben goes out to Mother Grub. I don't know what's wrong. I'm, I'm beating up Dante right left, you know, but I can pay nothing. But on, on a performance based job description, he's going to go like this. <clears throat> ben, you know, you and I don't always see eye to eye on things, but you're really doing a great job. So I just want to tell you, congratulations, you get five percent. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. I really do. In spite of you know everything. Dante, dude. Oh, man. You know, we've been talking about this before. I, I can't give you a raise today, but I want to. But look, <clears throat> tell me what we got to do to work together for the next three months. Let's, let's, you know, let's get it up there. Does that, does that sound fair? Sounds fair. Can you live with that? Yes, sir. Okay. You see, it's, it's not subjective, it's objective. And so, I've given Dante the opportunity not just to just pass over him, you know, but to us to work partner to move that to move that up, and make him a more productive employee, make him a more valuable employee. So and then you got, you know, your safety, your standard operating procedures, you got your uh, employee handbook. And just one quick question, comment about the employee handbook. Don't go down to Uncle Rufus and say, hey man, you've been in business a while, you mind if I can copy your employee handbook with my name on it? You can have these read back to you in a court of law. You put something in a handbook and then you as the owner violate that and your employees bring action against you, your own handbook will stand in judgment against you. So, and here's the, here's the other thing. I love I love entrepreneurs. Hear me on this. <clears throat> but they tend to have a a characteristic about trying to master everything and do it all on their own, get it by on the cheap. See, and there's just some things <clears throat> it's penny wise and pound foolish. So, certain things that you need to do like one time. Like incorporate, get an attorney to help you incorporate. Don't go down to uh, Office Depot and in the form section and go, oh, LLC, that's what I'm gonna be. Man, what benefits is there to, to an LLC over a C Corp or subject or S or C? You know, you, you, all of these things factor into it. Moving right along, you gotta have an operational. And this is a lot about where. Where is everything? <laughs> and now this is very industry sensitive. So I can put a whole bunch of stuff up here about Mountain Hill Beans, a business you're in. But you know, you got to have. <laughs> Uh, quality control. Just in time. Inventory. You got to have AR and AP and all the rest of that accounting stuff. You got to have projections. Production, maintenance. All 
of these things that go into the production of, of goods or, or services. Uh, and then after marketing, I mean after operational, you need marketing. And everybody says they're in the market. I don't care if they're selling in printing pens or hot air balloons or plant. <clears throat> but marketing, and I'm gonna put another why up here for you. Uh, what's your unique value proposition? And let me ask you, do we have any marketing majors in here? Okay. What do you think marketing is designed to do? Advertise. Advertise. That's what most people think. That's a that's a tactical definition of marketing. I want to talk about a strategic marketing this morning. <clears throat> marketing is designed <clears throat> to to. Uh, Identify your strengths in such a way that uh, your prospects are ultimately drawn to the logical conclusion they'd be a fool to do business with anybody but you, regardless of price. Marketing is about getting your prospect to call you. Marketing is like farming. You got you know, to break up the foul ground, as we said earlier. Plant seeds, and, and part of this has to do with the drip system. Where you, I've got another whole presentation on monopolizing marketplace. Can't get into all this today, but what is it unique about you, and, and what's your what's your innovation? In early 2014, I was coaching 10 businesses in Europe, and one in Germany, nine in the UK, and one of the one of the UK companies was in what they call the air conditioning fixings business. They talk just a little differently over there than we do here. But they didn't sell the units, they sold everything else, the ductwork, the, the, the insulation that went around with the copper tubing, the, the controls and relays and thermostats. <clears throat> and the first day I, I, I arrived, I went into the trade counter. Back of these warehouses, they'll have a trade counter where local HVAC people could come and pick up the parts and stuff. And on the side of the wall, there was a little, hey, uh, well, they don't even have eight and a half by 11 paper over there. It's, 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 it doesn't even fit our filing cabinets, but uh, whatever, that, whatever that paper was, it, it, it had a graphic that said, in this is 2014, you know, in 2013, 98.2% of our deliveries in London were on time. What do y'all think about that? Pretty good. Pretty good. Not bad at all. You know? Somebody else might have had a 99.4. They didn't say that. You see, what marketing does is you've got to drill down do you find a, a fact, a statistic, a witness that can document everybody wants to make the, the best buying decision, but many, too many times business owners don't give them the, enough information to make that decision, what's best. And so it's left up to the customer to figure that out. But in marketing, it's important to know, uh, and, and innovation, all of it, most of everything else I put up here is, I'm not gonna say it's one and done, but it's, you know, you sort of get it going and, and it kind of works. Marketing, you always have to be innovative. Think, think of marketing as a, as a two-sided coin or a business. One side is your inside reality. That's your operations, that's your people, that's your this. The other side is outside perception, and that's marketing. And the way I like to illustrate this is somewhere in the United States of America, this guy owned a 
nasty little oil change center. You can pull your car in there and he change your oil for you. But he got an idea one day. Maybe he got a new girlfriend. And she said, you need to clean that place up. But somewhere, he decided, I'm going to really get in there and clean this lobby area up. I'm putting a TV up there in the corner. I'm going to put a little play tent over here for the babies. And I'm going to give women 10% off if they come in on Wednesday afternoon. <clears throat> what do you think happened? You got more business. You got more business. Those women go, oh, that's cool. I can run in there get the oil change. I'm going to have to on that sorry husband of mine. <laughs> you see, but what do you think happened three weeks later to the nasty little oil change center two blocks down the road? They lost it. He did the same thing, right? And so now, it, that, that's the standard. They, they, they raised the standard. Well, that, that's not expected. So, but, but that's what I'm saying. Innovation, you have to always be innovating. What can we do quicker, faster, stronger, better? Don't start to lie. Don't, don't get comfortable on the we always did it this way. Uh, I need to keep track of time here. Sales plan. Oops. Right yeah. Oh. Sale plan. You got about 15 minutes, Ralph. Thank you, sir. I'm going to speed this up. Early in my career, I had about half an operation and half in sales. And that's kind of an odd duck because sales and operations don't always get along. As a matter of fact, I had a <clears throat> General sales man, well, I was I was in, man, in, in um, sales and moved over to operations for the uh, South Incorporation out of Texas. <clears throat> and, and the sales manager said, Ralph, tell me, how do you, what do you like best? You like sales or you like operations best? I said, well, Gene, you know how, <clears throat> how it is. I look at business like a football team. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I said, uh, the, the offense, their, their job is to put points on the board. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, the defense. Their job is to hold good field position to make it easy to score and hard to be scored on. Well, yeah, I, Ralph, I like that. And then I had Doc. I had the, the hook set. And I, then I said, "And you know what all, all great football coaches say, don't you?" He said, "What's that?" The best offense is a good defense. If you're if you've got a company that's putting out bad product and you don't you don't you don't have quality control, you don't have this, all your salespeople are gonna do is be running around putting out fires, making excuses. So always, always, always. And and sales where marketing is getting your prospects to call you sales as you call them. So I don't know how much of this I need to put up here because y'all are being in sales. Uh, but you need a, a sales strategy. Um, uh, sales training. And, and by strategy, I mean big ticket items, you sell them differently than small ticket items. There's a, there's a book called Spin Selling, S-P-I-N, that works for uh, for big ticket items, uh, it stands for what's your situation. You ask a few, ask a few situation questions. You're uh, start talking about problems. You get those magnified the implications of those problems, and then what's the need? The, uh, the need analysis that goes along with that. But you got to have a CRM system. You got to have a, uh, data, a database, and there, there's essentially two. Big, when you break marketing down two big chunks, you've got direct marketing, um, not direct, um, defined marketing, defined. and that is if you're selling truck bodies, you want to, you can go buy a list of all the truck dealers. You don't have to do. Um, Get people to raise their hand. Uh, the other is mass marketing. This is like TVs, and everybody got them. You just don't know whose TV you blew up. Because you didn't win the ball game. I didn't say that. <clears throat> anyway, 
Uh, mass marketing, you got to do a lot of advertising, as the gentleman in the back said, because you, you don't know. The fine marketing, you can buy your database and, and get moving on it. And I'm going to get moving on this. Finally, you need a financial plan. And of course, this would be how much? And I'm sure you've been involved in the business, you know, you got a PL and you got a balance sheet. And there is a statement of cash flows. Generally, when they get a PL, they, they get it. They, it's it's uh, income and expenses over a period of time, a month, a quarter, a year. So you get your, get your PL, you look down there, telephone, $200. Got it. Got it. $200 on a telephone. When you put the balance sheet in front of them, this, this fog starts rolling in. You know? Like, I'm not quite sure what that means. And you go in and, and somebody goes, you know, my, my PL says I'm making a lot of money, but I'm, you know, it ain't in the bank. I said, I got an idea. Why don't you give me a copy of your uh, accounts receivable and let's take a walk through the inventory. Let's go take a walk through your warehouse. Because generally you're going to find out that their inventory has swollen or their days outstanding has gotten long. They've gotten into banking business. And most of them never heard of state of the cash flows. But these are accounting reports that your CPA does for doing your taxes. And you got to have a budget. Sounds like a four-letter word, I know. <clears throat> but it's not. No. And then from your budget, you can start looking at forward-looking management. See, these are all historical. It's like try trying to run a business on those three. It's like driving down a road with your windshield painted black looking in the rearview mirror. See where you've been, but you can't see where you're going. So, <clears throat> when you get a budget, then you can have a variance report. And this, this produces like a series of red, yellow, and green lights over here on the right. Budget versus actual. And a lot of people, and if you decide you're going to go cheap on your accounting package and get QuickBooks and you load it in your computer and it goes, are you a restaurant? Are you a clothing store? You know, it's trying to figure out how to set up your chart accounts. Uh, but normally people, business owners will look at this year versus last year. And when I ask them, was like, how was last year? Well, wasn't that good? Why are you comparing it to last year then? You know, it's like you don't, it's like a tape measure that stretches. You, you measure yourself against a, something that varies. A budget is like a good hard, you know, tape measure. You know where you know, where you know you are. And the other one is a um, dashboard flash report, KPI, key performance indicator. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, when you take over the business, mom and daddy can be on a cruise ship on the other side of the world, and they get these, and they'll know right off the bat where the problems are. But you're going to know too, and you're going to be out there trying to figure it out what's going on before daddy calls. Going, hey son, mom and daddy got to come home early. Sir, no sir. And so, <clears throat> we're talking about how to get where we want to be. And underlying all of this, we talked about a little bit of this up to this point, is entity structure, asset protection, tax minimization. Exit strategy or succession. 
plan. Yes. Any destruction, we talked just briefly about it. You're going to be an S Corp, sub S, C Corp, whatever. Sometimes business owners put all their, all their eggs in one basket. And smart business owners, if they own the, if they own the building, if y'all own your building, you own two buildings, do you have them set up as a separate real estate trust? Mm, no, so one's, they're both shops. One's a five Doesn't shop, matter. one's a... Doesn't matter. You own them? Yeah. Okay. Are they, are they owned by the business? Yes. Okay. So if somebody comes in and, and sues you, they can get your real estate, everything. So you, generally, you, you'd have your real estate in a separate company. So when you sold the business, you could maybe hang on to that and keep renting, that, renting out the space to the new owner. What about your trucks? You can, put, you can have a vehicle leasing company. So if, you, if one of your drivers got in a wreck, kill somebody and they're trying to sue you, you know, you're limited your liability. And that goes over into asset protection. But also insurance uh, is involved with that. Tax minimization, don't need to say much about that, but exit strategy is when you're trying to, when you got to the end of the road, you don't have any heirs, you don't want to give it to your employees. You, you, you got a package up to sell it. That's an exit strategy. A succession plan, how do we hand it off to the next generation? How do we pass the business on in a manner that it doesn't impact the family? And this is the big takeaway, the big finale, offer call, <laughs> if you will. The best exit strategy or succession plan is a business structured to run without the daily oversight of the owner. If you are the business, when that day comes, you don't get anything. So, questions, comments? Yes, sir. What you said is your system was again? <clears throat> okay, in the marketing. And this, this is sort of works in the, uh, in the computer thing. You may have 60 pre-formatted emails about your company, about your just blurbs. And so you, you set it up, you can load them up into a, a constant contact kind of software <coughs> where they start dripping on. One week it might be on a Monday morning, 10 o'clock. <coughs> Next week it might be on a Tuesday afternoon. But they come in at random times. But you just keep it in front of them. And, and there's a lot more to be said about marketing that we just don't have time for today. But it's, it's about your unique value proposition. What is it that you do better than anybody else, and how can you prove it? 98.2% on time delivery. If I was in the air conditioning fixing business in London, I'd be doing business with that guy. Nothing would be worse, right? You go out there to put in. The Smith's air conditioner, <laughs> you got the unit, and the guys are all sitting around playing cards, but they don't have the stuff that it takes to pull all that together. Okay? All right. It's been my great joy and delight to be with you today, and I encourage you to seek greatness. Thank you. So I'm not going to argue with him because he's older than I am and got a lot more experience than I do. But I would say, if you're thinking about incorporating, a lawyer is going to charge you a bunch of money. You come down to our office, we're going to help you do it for nothing. There you go. <laughs> we're we're going to do it right. We're going to do it legal. And if we get into a situation where we're not sure what we're doing, we can talk to a lawyer. A lawyer is going to build our office and not you. So we got that going for us. Um, if you need to write a business plan, we've got templates. We can send you the blank templates. You can get those online. You get all this stuff online. Unfortunately, we had a guy in our office yesterday who told me he got his LLC through Rocket Lawyers online. Oh, oh man. So he's paid money to them. And he may or may not have gotten as good of what he'd get from us and he spent some money. So um, can help a bit. Uh, on the marketing, um, uh, the economic development director who was here last week, um, Candace, talked about a gap report. So when you're trying to figure out what's my unique thing, what does our community need? Wherever you are, go to an economic development director in your community, your city, or your county, and get that gap report. And they'll tell you what your community is missing, what, what isn't in your community. 
um, to let you know. Or if you're thinking about doing uh, computer fix it business and you do that gap report and find out there are 350 people already doing that in your county, probably need to think about doing something else. So there, there are resources available. Um, and then on the succession plan, um, that is crazy important right now. Yes. Because there are a lot of people between my age and Ralph's age who are about to get out of business and they don't have somebody to hand the business off to. And those businesses are going to be for sale or they're just going to get completely shut down. Um, last week we did a seminar at Small Business Center, 99 questions to ask and answer before you purchase an existing business. There are a lot of questions, uh, there are a lot of advantages to buying something that already exists, there's a lot of disadvantages to buying something that already exists. But there are a great deal of questions you need to ask and think about before you go out and buy an existing business, and we can help with some of that. So all of the things that, I mean, there, there's nothing that you talked about that I would disagree with in any way, shape, or form. I would just say that there are a lot of resources in your community. If you're not from Stanley County, find them where you're from. If you're in North Carolina, there's a small business center. There's an economic development director. There are people in your community who can help you think through what you are trying to do and people who can assist you in doing that in your community. I and mean, I think that's part of why I came three weeks, or the first time I came, was just to try and share some resources that are available in your community. You don't have to do this by yourself. Um, Ralph said, too many entrepreneurs think they know it all or need to do it all or fix it all. And they end up, they might be really good at the computer side, but horrible at the bookkeeping side. Um, find some people who can help you. Find some people who can help you be successful. Um, and maybe you help them be successful along the way. Get two or three small businesses working together, and some really cool things can happen. So, um, so that's what we've been doing. Um, uh, outside of Mr. Gross's house um, over the weekend, um, there was a, a DOT truck pulled up. And he thought it was kind of strange, so he, he watched. And um, the driver got out of the truck and dug a big hole and got back in the truck and sat there for a few minutes. And then the other guy in the truck got out and filled the hole back in. And then the truck went about 100 yards down the road and they did the same thing. Driver got out, dug a hole, got back in the truck, sat down, other guy got out, filled the hole back in. About the third time this happened, Dr. Grossi said he was gonna figure out what in the world's going on. So he walks down there and he says, gentlemen, just notice you kind of doing this stuff, what's going on? He said, we're from the NC, Department of Transportation Highway Beautification Program. We're planting trees all along rural roads in North Carolina so they'd be beautiful. And the driver said, you know, my name's, my name's Reese, and I, um, I dig the holes. And then we got Ed, and Ed puts the tree in the hole. And then we got Julie, and Julie fills the hole back in. Well, Ed called in sick today. You get it? What you do is important. What you do is unique, and what you do is valuable. And I can do my job, and you can do your job, but if the other person isn't doing their job, we're going to struggle. My encouragement would be find what you do, whether it's digging the hole, filling the hole back in, or putting the tree in. Find what you do, what you enjoy doing, and be the best at that you can possibly be. And you will always have something to do, and you will always be excited about getting up and going to work in the morning instead of worrying about how much money we can make or, or how, what somebody else is doing down the street, or how big their house is. Find out what you do really, really well. And go do that and have a lot of fun. If there's some way the Small Business Center can help you do that, that's literally why we exist. It's why I get out of bed in the morning. It's to help you be successful at what you're trying to do. So if we can help you in some way, please let us know. Whether you're a student, whether, you know, again, if you're not from Stanley County, we can help you find those same resources in another part of the world. So um, that's what we do. Any questions for me or Ralph or Patty or anybody else? I'm not certain, but I think this is the last time I'm going to see you this semester. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't lay any bets on that. So. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Gross, for the partnership. Uh, thank you, Ralph, for your time and your expertise, and uh, and all of you for um, for your uh, attention. He's got the job descriptions there. If you want to grab one of those on the way out, have a wonderful afternoon, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>